Okay. Sorry, folks. I know that was a little longer than normal. Hopefully, you've been enjoying your time to reconnect. We were having a little bit of technical difficulties, uh, but we've got everything back and working again. Uh, the joy of technology. But you know what? I, what I saw during this time is we were doing a lot of reconnecting, and that's a lot of what this is about today on our Net Sunday. So I'm going to invite you to find your seat. We're going to do a few more songs here together. We're going to do a few more songs here together in a moment. And um, this is the time for us to worship. And worship is, is the way that we feel that we're connecting with God. Uh, so in this, this time, as we sing these songs, I'm going to encourage you to take this time to open your heart to what God is saying and doing. We're also going to open up our altar over here. And this is a, a place where uh, we're going to open up for prayer. And if you're in this room and you have a need right now, I'm going to invite you to come forward and receive prayer. And uh, as we're getting ready for that, I'm going to invite Pastor Glenn. Glenn and Lois are going to be leading prayer right now. But I'm just going to invite Pastor Glenn to come and share a little bit about uh, his heart right now. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Reg. I just want to share a word of ex exhortation on faith. Appreciate the message that Pastor Greg has been preaching on the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit singular of the Spirit, which includes all nine of them, right? <laughs> and, uh, and one of the messages that you preached, Pastor Greg, on faith, faithfulness and faith was very, very powerful. And, uh, and how do we build our faith? When you come to the altar today or whenever you go to pray, believe that something is going to happen. Don't come here and say, well, we're going to try this, and, you know. I mean, it's okay, but let's come with faith, believing that God hears our prayers. Remember one of the disciples, he said, Lord, I believe, but help thou my unbelief. <laughs> we all believe, but we also have some unbelief. And if you're struggling with that today, we're just going to pray that God's going to help you to, be, to put that aside and say, we're going to trust God. And we say that to all of you that are here, but also those of you online. And you may be home in your own place, and you have a need in your life, believe God together with us. Out of the many, many miracles my wife and I remember, one of them stands out in my mind when we were in Manitoba. And uh, this lady was crippled, walking on crutches. And she, she uh, couldn't come to church anymore. She stayed at home. The message I had preached that day was Jesus passed by. I got home after the service, and on the end of the line, I hear this lady with a high-pitched voice, Jesus passed by. Jesus passed by. She was just hysterical. She'd heard the message, and she took her crutches, put them in the corner, and never used them again the rest of her life. And she was in her 70s at that time, you know? And so, so don't count yourself out because of your age or you've tried it before. Let's believe God today. Amen. He is a miracle-working God. You are a miracle. Amen? God bless you. Why don't you stand with us as we go back in time of worship? I find it interesting that as we talked last week about breath and about uh, the fact that uh, we take so many things for granted, it's funny how the air is a little challenged this morning, isn't it? And uh, the good news is that we can still praise God with all of our being, all of our might. Uh, if you've got to sit for a bit because uh, the air is bothering you a bit, that's okay. But I encourage you this morning just to, just to give God your all in this time.
Your glory 
song that we have been singing brought me back to this passage of scripture that I read in our prayer room this morning the very God that we are calling upon right now the very God that says I'll meet you where you're at Pastor Glenn talked about faith. Taking that step of faith. But what are we taking a step of faith in? What what is the purpose for all this? Why do we do this? We get excited and we pray and we worship and we say, Thank you, Lord. Psalm chapter 18 starts out, I will love you, O Lord, my strength. If you're weak this morning, God says I'm your strength. If you are wondering what's happening, God says I'm your strength. I will bring you through to the other side of the storm that you're in. That indecision that you you don't have an answer for. He says, I'm your strength. I will bring you through. And he says, the Lord is my rock and my fortress. That storm that you think is overwhelming and you can't see the other side of it. God wants you to know. He already knows what's on the other side of the storm and he's going to bring you through. The Lord is my rock and my fortress, a place of protection, and my deliverer. My deliverer. Take that verse and hide it in your heart. God is your strength. God is your fortress, your protection. But even more than that, he's your deliverer. When you're in the middle of a storm, he will deliver you. He will bring you through it. He's your God. He's your God. He's not some abstract thought process. He is your God. My strength in whom I will trust. We can trust on him. We can trust the Holy Spirit. We can trust Jesus. We can trust him. He's not going to let you down. He's not going to leave you in some deserted place. 
you can trust him. He's your shield. He's your shield and he's your horn of salvation. Wow. He's my stronghold. Verse three says, and I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised and so shall I be saved from my enemies. to say that word overwhelmed and that word overcome kind of bothers me a little bit (laughs) because in myself there's that initial point of weakness where I'm losing control that's what it feels like and sometimes it's even harder because we're surrounded by people and at the end of the day we want to believe that we trust everybody in the room but there's something about it where when we're exposed like that and we feel God overwhelming us, sometimes we resist it because we're just afraid of what we look like and we're afraid of losing control. And uh, sometimes it's on an easy path to work through, but I just want to say this morning, I mean, we're, we're at the end of this time of music, but this is a safe space. And, you know, however God is speaking to you, um, if it's affecting you, if it's really affecting you, that's okay. It really is. And uh, sometimes we draw, you know, we tend to draw firm lines between, uh, you know, men and women. And sometimes men feel like, uh, you know, they got to be just a little bit stronger. And uh, Pastor Glenn, I just want to commend you today because you wear your heart on your sleeve. And you're an example to people in this room that says, you know what? I can be overcome by the presence of God. And that's a beautiful thing. And... uh, some of its personality too. Some of us are a little bit more cerebral and we don't want to be affected that emotionally, especially publicly. Uh, crying is one of those things that perhaps we only do uh, in absolute privacy. Um, but I just encourage you this morning, uh, if God's speaking to you and you're overcome by that and, you're, and maybe you're resisting it, this is a safe space. And, uh, and maybe if this doesn't feel safe, for whatever reason, I encourage you to go home today and find a time quietly with the Lord and process what you need to process. Because for breakthroughs to happen, we have to be willing uh, not only just to surrender ourselves, but to be vulnerable in that space. And if you're not able to do that here, but you also don't make time at home, you'll never experience the fullness of what God has for you and that next step he wants you to experience. So I don't know who that's for this morning. Sometimes God just gives a key word to pick up on, and this morning, that's the word. Um, If you just don't feel like you can be that open here, that's okay. But please, take time. Go home. Get in your prayer closet or the bathroom. Go outside. Whatever whatever works for you. And ask God uh, to give you that revelation that you would be changed. Um, Because as much as I love this church, it's those changes that make all the difference in the world. It's not the service. It's not getting together. I mean, I love this, and I'm glad we can get together and have communion, have community. It's great. It's wonderful. Uh, But at the end of the day, if it's lacking that power of change in your life, it just kind of loses its meaning. 
So if you can't find that here today, if you're resisting it, I encourage you, go home. Find space with the Lord. Anyway, hope you've been blessed in this time. Lord, we thank you that we can come together and worship you. We're thankful that we have a room full of, of every generation. Thankful for kids. Thankful for a ministry that can actually teach our kids as well. Or we're thankful that we have a, a pastor with a heart for that. Not just a space for kids to go so the adults can learn, but a space where kids can learn about God too. Amen. Thank you, Lord. We bless you in Jesus' name. Folks, let's, uh, let's welcome Pastor Ryan this morning. Well, good morning, everybody. It is awesome to be spending this time with you guys today. And I think I hear Bill and Jenna wanting to get out as well. Oh, hey there, Bill. Hi, Pastor Ryan. And good morning, Jenna. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Hi. Hi, everybody. Oh, look at all the kids here today. Oh, Hi, everyone. Yeah. Good to see you guys. Hi. Mm -hmm. Now, before you say anything today, Pastor Ryan, I think that Bill has something special that he wants to do for you. Oh, that, that sounds interesting. Uh, what is it, Bill? Well, you see, it's been several months since you last heard me sing. Mm -hmm. And I know you loved it so much. Well, yeah, I think the last time I heard you sing was like Christmas time. That would be it. Yeah. So since today is your birthday, mm -hmm. I figured I would give you the gift of song again. Oh, boy, I can hardly wait. Well, that is, that is exciting. What are you going to sing, the, uh, the happy birthday song? Well, actually, I've got eight songs for you today. Eight. Oh, eight songs. Uh, Bill, I don't think we have time for eight songs. Mm -hmm. We have to let the kids go downstairs. Oh, oh don't worry. I'm not going to sing them all right now. I went ahead and recorded the songs onto a CD so Pastor Ryan can listen to them anytime he wants. Nice. Hold on a moment. I'll go grab it for you. That sounds exciting. <laughs> oh, sweet. Uh, it's called You're Old Now by William Billy Bill. That's, that's very nice of you, Bill. This is, you're, you're this is awesome. Thank you. Now, I was going to put this on an eight-track tape for you since you're so old, but <laughs> I couldn't find an MP3 to eight-track converter. Mm. Um, uh, what's an A-track? You know, you may need to ask the grandpa for that information. Oh, okay. I guess I'll ask Pastor Greg after the service. Mm, good call. Well, well, thank you for this, Bill. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Oh, and you know a great place to play this CD would be at your birthday party. Oh, Ooh. I love birthday parties. They are so much fun. Just make sure you don't send out your invitations via carrier pigeons. They may not get to their proper destination. Uh, you mean like you did with your I Forgot Day party invitations? Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we're still training some of the pigeons to deliver the messages instead of eating them. It, it's a common problem. I believe you guys. Now, since we've been talking about parties so much, how would you guys feel about watching a Bible story about an incredibly awesome party? Oh, that sounds like fun. Mm -hmm. Let's watch it. Yeah, what are we waiting for? Yeah, I agree. Uh, tech team, do you want to throw this week's video on? Stories of the Bible, the parable of the great banquet. This is Jesus, hey who is the Son of God and the Savior of the world. While Jesus was on earth, he taught everyone about God's love and healed people from their sickness. He did many miracles like walking on water. Oh, hey guys. And even raised people from the dead. One day, Jesus went to eat at the house of a Pharisee. He said to the Pharisee who was hosting the meal, When you give a dinner, do not invite your friends, your family, or your rich neighbors, for they will invite you back, and that will be your only reward. But invite the poor and those who have trouble seeing and walking. Then God will reward you for inviting those who could not repay you. When a man at the table heard what Jesus said, Ahem. He said to Jesus, What a blessing it will be to attend a banquet in the kingdom of God. Jesus replied with a story. A man prepared a great feast and sent out many invitations. Already! When the banquet was ready, he sent his servant to tell the guests, Come, the banquet is ready. Ah. But they all began making excuses. One said, I have just bought a field and must inspect it. 
please excuse me. Another said, I have just bought five pairs of oxen and I want to try them out. Please excuse me. Another said, I just got married, so I can't come. The servant returned and told his master what they had said. What? No way. His master was furious and said, go quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and invite the poor. And those who have trouble seeing and walking, After the servant had done this, he reported, there is still room for more. Great, all right. So his master said, go out into the country lanes and behind the hedges and urge anyone you find to come so that the house will be full. For none of those I first invited will get even the smallest taste of my banquet. So guys, what did you think of this week's video? Well, I, I loved it so much. In fact, I took several notes. Oh, what kind of notes did you take? Well, next time I have a party, instead of sending out carrier pigeons, I think I'm going to send out a fancy butler to go invite my guests. Mm -hmm. mm. Well, is that all you got from this video, Bill? <laughs> well, no, but I'll admit I'm, I'm a little confused about the rest. Well, what, what's got you confused, Bill? Well. Why did all those people who were invited at the beginning make up such lame excuses for not going to the banquet? Yeah, didn't they know that the party would be way more fun than looking at a field or playing with some ox? Well, you'd think so, right? But that's what they chose. Yeah, and they missed out in a really big way. Mm -hmm. They sure did. But Pastor Ryan, why did the master go and tell the servant to invite all those people? Okay, well, remember this, uh, this story is a parable. It's uh, a story meant to teach us something important. Well... What's this trying to teach us? Well, there's a few things, actually. One of them being that uh, Jesus, what Jesus said at the very beginning about how we should invite those people who are in need to our feasts and celebrations. Oh, so, yeah. yeah. That does seem like a good idea. Mm -hmm. I bet God is very happy when we help and take care of those in need. Oh, he sure is. Okay, that does seem very important. But you said there was more that we can learn from this as well. You bet. And it, it lines up with a lot of what we've been talking about here lately. You mean about sharing the good news of Jesus with people? That's right. You see, this parable is showing us that God wants anyone and everyone to come to him. It doesn't matter their job or their age or what they look like or sound like. He's happy to invite everyone. Oh, I guess we're all kind of like the servant in this story. We have all been given a job of inviting everyone that can come. Mm -hmm. That's very right. Very true. Wow, that's very cool. I think I'm going to go plan a barbecue for later this week and see who I can invite. Mm -hmm. Oh, boy. Are you going to have barbecue octopus? Well, I most certainly am. Well, that sounds like fun. Do you want some help planning and inviting people? That would be wonderful, Jenna. Oh, great. Let's get started. Well, I guess that means that uh, we're done for today. Yeah. Well, All right. Bye, goodbye. everybody. Goodbye, awesome. kids. Bye, kids. Coming, guys. Bye, bye. Bye up there. Bye. 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 <laughs> well... I think Bill and Jenna learned something very important today. I hope you guys did as well. Uh, now, before I invite Pastor Greg up, uh, I'm going to remind you guys all, we've got a silent auction coming up next week. So it's going to run for two weeks. You guys will be able to check out all the exciting items in the Fellowship Hall after the services. And with that, I'll pass things off to Pastor Greg. Ready? Are the kids already out of here? All right, kids, you are free to go. All righty. So, folks, I, uh, I know Pastor Ryan just reminded us about the, uh, the auction, but uh, he showed me something today that someone donated, and I thought it was so cool. I just want to give another plug for the silent auction. What you're looking at here, it, it, this is very nice, eh? Once you know what it is, it's even going to be, be more impressive, I think. This used to be something we sat on. This is one of our pews has been turned into this bowl, all right? And, and this was done by uh, Lyle Wager uh, and donated. Yeah, absolutely. So some people we know, we, we add pews 
uh, that went um, uh, out to different people, and some people took it to make projects and whatnot. Well, one of the things uh, that Lyle has made here is, uh, is this bowl with some of the wood that was uh, donated uh, or in those pews. So if you want a little piece of church history, there's this one, and there's also a platter as well, uh, and there are other items. And if you want a little piece of church history, then you can make a, a bid on this one and all the money going to our youth group and whatever goes above and beyond, of course, will be going towards our uh, building uh, fund here for the new upgrade. But this is just a wonderful job. And if Lyle is watching, by the way, thank you so much. Such a wonderful job with this. Uh, really good. Amen. Amen. I'll just put that over there for now. Before we go into... The word, I just want to pray. I know we've, we've prayed a lot. That's part of what we do here. If you're visiting here, uh, you may say, wow, they sure do spend a lot of time talking and praying. And that's part of what it is to be a part of a family. We celebrate about the things we, we, we can celebrate for, but also we lift each other up uh, when, when times are tough and when people need to encourage one another. Uh, so uh, we've already had some prayer time here. As I go into uh, the Word, I want to pray that God would just be with us. But also, um, there's a prayer request that I think is going to be near to a lot of folks here. A lot of, we're, a lot of people were touched by um, the recent accident that happened um, uh, north of town last week, where a, a young woman uh, lost her life, um, and she was known to a lot of folks here in our church and in our community. Her name was Bree. And uh, I know especially a lot of our young adults would have known her and known her well, and there's a lot of connections, and I know a lot of people are hurting at this time. And we just want to take a moment to lift up those um, that were near to her and those that are affected. She left behind a fiancé and, and two kids and only a young woman, and uh, so many that knew and loved her. And, and this is something that strikes into our community, and uh, we're just going to invite God's presence to just minister in that situation so, Lord, we know, um, we know that you are present uh, even in the darkest times. We thank you, Lord, for that. And we thank you this morning that you are here with us uh, in this place. But we also thank you that you're not just limited to this place, that your spirit can go wherever, that you are uh, wherever you're needed, Lord. And I thank you, Lord, that your desire is to bring hope and peace and comfort to those that are hurting. And Lord, this morning, we just ask that you would minister to the family members, the friends, the loved ones, all of those, especially, Lord, uh, the, the fiancé, the kids, Lord. Uh, I just pray right now that your hand of peace and comfort would be on them. And I pray that through these, this tragedy, Lord, and, and we also know there was another one, Lord, south of town. And, and Lord, we, we understand that loss is, is all around us. But Lord, we especially lift up those that were touched by this one right now. Those in our own church family that may be here today and still hurting and reeling from that. And uh, those in our church community and those that may be watching online, Lord, I just ask that your peace and your presence would be with them. And Lord, we understand that uh, bad things happen, and sometimes we ask why. But Lord, today we just ask that you would bring some light into the darkness and some peace into the turmoil and some comfort to those that hurt. Uh, be with me right now as we uh, go into this uh, uh, time of speaking the word. I pray that you would give me your heart, your mind, and I pray that you would give us ears to hear what it is you're saying. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. How's everybody doing so far? Good, good, good. I'm glad to, that you're still here with us. Um, as I said, this is our net Sunday, so this is a Sunday where I take a little bit more time to explain what it is we do, and as I've said before, if you have questions about anything that's being spoken right now, um, feel free to, to talk to me after the service. I'd love to be able to try my best to explain whether you're here or whether you're watching online. Um, as has already been alluded to, um, I've been speaking for a few weeks now. I'm sorry, I'm going to readjust my mic because I think that's going to be annoying to us. Amen. We've been speaking for a few weeks now on this idea of the fruit of the Spirit. Now, the bigger concept that we're talking about um, is the idea that God is working in people to make people better than what they currently are. And you may say, what are you talking about? Everybody's perfect the way they are. Everybody's great. Everybody's wonderful. You are good the way that you are. Um, that's not true. <laughs> 
All right? I'm not saying that, that we don't have good things in us. I'm not saying that we, we, we don't have potential. The truth is we're all created in God's image, and all of us have the potential to be so much more than we are. But the truth is every person that has ever lived, every person that is currently alive, has faults. You may say, well, almost everybody, Pastor Greg, but not me. All right? But, but we know the truth. You, you know you. you. You know who you are. And the truth is, I'm not saying that everybody are, is a terrible person. What I'm saying is everybody is a work in progress. And God's desire ultimately is to make you into the best version of you that there could be. That's what he wants to do. That's part of what this, this, this gospel is, this good news. He doesn't just want to say you're forgiven. What he wants to do is to say You've been forgiven. Now you can become what I planned for you to be from the beginning. He is working in you, sometimes with you, sometimes even in spite of you, to help mold you into a better version of you, the best version of you, the you that God wants you to be. Now, I want you to understand, this starts with him. First and foremost, we can try all we want to be good people. We can try all we want to try to be a better version of ourselves. We can, we can fix things. We can improve things. We can start exercising. We can start smiling more. We can start being nice to people. And all those things are wonderful in and of themselves. But to really address the heart of the matter, what's really plaguing us, it's not just something that's on the outside. It's something that's on the inside. And that can only be fixed for, through him. So we come to him first. And we say, Jesus, I need you to help me. I need your forgiveness. I need your new life. And that's what the Bible talks about that he gives us. When we come to him and we say, Lord, I recognize that I'm a faulty person. I need help. What he does is he applies forgiveness to, his, to our life. Because Jesus died on the cross and, and made a way for us to be forgiven. Now we can have new life in him. We can be different. We can be better. So you might be thinking, oh, that means that everybody in this church, right? Everybody in this church that has already said yes to Jesus has said, yes, I accept Jesus as forgiveness and I believe that he died for me and I've asked him to help me. That must mean that I'm a perfect person. No, I'm sorry. You're still a work in progress. You are, I am. Some of you are, are a lot further down the line than I am. And I can look up to you and say, oh, one day I, I want to have the love that that guy has. Someday I want to have the patience that that person has. Someday I want to be able to, to have that level of kindness. And the good news is God is working in us. But it takes time. And that's why I believe so often in Scripture he uses the analogy of a garden, fruit. And that's what we've been talking about. Gardens take time, amen? Amen. All right? You, you don't just, you know, put something in the ground and then go back the next day and you have the finished product. It takes time. And that's what God is doing in us. The good news is he's already started the work. And he invites us to work with him, to believe him, to allow him to do work in our life. So we've been talking about the fruit of the Spirit. What are they? Here, here are, are, here's a list that's in Scripture, that's in our Bible, our holy book, the book that we believe is true, that is the Word of God. Here's one of the lists that he gives us to explain uh, some of these uh, things that he wants to do in our life, some of these fruit that he wants to grow in our garden. Love, joy, peace, forbearance, which is another word for patience, but it's more than that. All right, those that have been with us for a while, I explained that one. Kindness, goodness. Faithfulness, we've actually been talking about faith, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. So we've already spent weeks talking about some of these concepts. We've talked about love, how important it is. It's the center. It's, it's the foundation. What, what, what love is so, so important for, for the Christian life, but it's, it's who God is, and it's what he wants to build in us. Joy. We've talked about the importance of joy. Oh, it is the ultimate goal. It's not just something that, that we get once everything else is done. God wants us to live in joy. Peace. 
Peace is not just the absence of turmoil, but it's something different. It's, it's a calm and it's the presence of God in every situation. Even when everything around you may be in a storm, it's being able to, to have that level of calmness, that level of, of, of peace in the middle of it. Forbearance, not just being able to wait calmly at a traffic light or wait for that Christmas present that's, that's on the way, but being able to endure when things are tough, when you have opposition, when you have people against you, being able to endure it. Kindness, the ability to speak kindly to people, to treat people kind, to be able to respond to people, especially those that maybe aren't that kind to us. Goodness, we've talked about this for a few weeks. We talked about uh, what goodness is and the importance of it. I know God is good and he wants us to reflect that goodness in the way we interact with people. And last week we talked, or last three weeks, we talked about faith. The ability to, to believe for more than what we can see. To be able to look forward into the future and believe what God says is true. To believe that what he has said is more accurate, is more safe, is more reliable than anything else that we can hear or see. And now we're moving into a new one. Gentleness. Gentleness. The word in Greek is uh, prahotes. And again, I have no idea if that's correct. But I always assume that you don't either, so I think we're okay. It's, it's all right. I don't know if I said it right, but that's okay. That's the word. Anyway, prahotes, gentleness. What comes to your mind when you think of the word gentle? What comes to your mind? Gentle. That's a good one father holding a baby. It's one of the first things I think about as well. What else comes to mind when you hear the word gentle? That's a hard one. Okay. Sorry? Good. Yeah. Anyone else? I heard... Oh, a horse coming up for a snuggle. That's good. Yeah, that's perfect. Someone who sees someone in a fault yeah. and uh, overlooks it or uh, doesn't come down on that person. Good. Uh, going gentle there. So you, you four have already preached my message, so I think we're done. Okay, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> There's the gist of it. Good. So we're all on the same page already, but, but, but it might take me a little longer to get here than, than you, you four folks. Okay. Another, another word that's used in Scripture uh, in other translations, and especially if you grew up with the King James Version of the, of the Bible, uh, the word that you may have heard was meek, meekness. And gentleness is, is something that you, you get a, a, a picture in mind, but meekness, uh, even though it's the same word, it's the same word translated, pra, prahotes, maybe meekness evokes a different thing in your mind. I know when I was younger, and as I was a kid, for a long time, I really associated this idea of gentleness or meekness with the idea of weakness. You know, I may not have said that, but in my mind, if I heard that somebody was meek or somebody was gentle, and especially as a young man, all right, growing up, especially as a boy and then as a young man, if you heard, oh, that person is gentle, or, or you heard the words, that's a really meek individual. Really, a lot of times what I thought was, that person is a weak person. That's, that's sort of what came to mind. I don't know about you, but I had this association for a long time. And as such, when I heard the idea of Jesus being gentle, there's even a song about it, an old song, Gentle Jesus, Meek and Mild, you may have heard it, right? It's an old hymn. Right? When I thought about gentle Jesus, meek and mild, and I saw the pictures of gentle Jesus, meek and mild, and I watched the videos of gentle Jesus, meek and mild, I got the idea of a Jesus that was actually not gentle, but a Jesus that was weak. That's honest. That's, that's what I got. And I think as a man especially in a young man growing up, I had this idea that sometimes gentle Jesus was the opposite of, of strong Jesus. 
And, and, and the idea is that God was, was calling us as men not to be strong, but just to be weak. Now, that's a real problem. That's a real problem. It's a problem for everybody, but I think that there's a real problem in that, especially for men. This idea of weakness can be an issue for a lot of us. Men are... Young men are getting a lot of confusing messages these days about what is right and what is wrong and how they react in the world, how they live in the world. And sometimes the message that's being conveyed to them, whether it's intentional or not, is that everything about you that may seem strong is bad. Everything about you that may seem aggressive even is, is bad. And a lot of young men, I think, are growing up with this idea that that part of them that longs to be strong physically, emotionally, mentally, that part of them that is, is, is feels from, from, from the inside that they need to be stronger than what they are, I think a lot of young men especially are getting the opinion, getting the, the message from society around them that strength is actually a problem. Sometimes it's been defined, and I'm not trying to, to stir up anything, but sometimes it's, you've, you've heard this word toxic masculinity, right? And trust me, there are some things about people that can be toxic. There's some things in my life that have been toxic. There's probably some things in your life that has been toxic. But, but let me be clear, masculinity is not toxic. Strength is not toxic. God wants us to be strong people, and I'll say this especially to you gentlemen that are here, and especially young men if you're listening. God wants you to be strong. Jesus was strong. Strength is not the problem, and gentleness is not the opposite of strength. Jesus was not weak. Jesus was, we find out in, in, in the first uh, book of John, the first few, few verses, that when creation happened, it was, it was through Jesus that it happened. He was strong enough to speak this world into creation. And he was strong enough to be able to speak the truth, and nothing is stronger than the truth. But he was gentle, and he is gentle. Words are powerful. Jesus is not weak. And when he walked this world, he was not weak, but he was gentle. And you may say, well, what's the difference? And I think the first example we heard when, when I said the word gentle is the one that comes to my mind. When I think of gentleness, uh, I can relate real well right now. We have a, a little baby in our home right now. Not, not my baby, not our baby, but we have someone that's staying with us for a while. Um, uh, Selena is, is here, and she just had a newborn. A uh, little, his name is Wolf, short for Wolfgang. I know, don't hear that one much anymore, but he's a cute little guy, brand new baby. And, you know, I've had kids myself, but my youngest right now is 13, and I've got grandkids, um, and, and they're growing up, but it seems like no matter when I come around a little baby, I always have the same struggle. When I first meet this little baby, this little newborn, how do I touch it? How do I interact with it? How am I going to hold this thing? I mean, it, it's not heavy. It's, 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 it's not really that difficult of a question. But every time I go in to grab it, I'm always like wondering, well, where does my hand go? Where does my arm go? I don't want to damage this little one. So I end up approaching it like I'm, I'm picking up something radioactive. You know, it's like I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm a little bit concerned, right? And it's funny because I, I'm sure I looked terrified of this thing. And anybody from the outside, if they didn't understand what was happening, when they see me taking this baby up and so carefully and so, so thing, they must be like, well, does that baby weigh 200 pounds? Why is he so slow? Why is he so careful with this thing? But at the end of the day, it's not a matter of I'm not strong enough to, to handle the baby. I, I, I want to be gentle enough that my strength doesn't injure it. You see? Now, if I were to, to come alongside and say, okay, uh, who am I going to pick on here? Uh, Pastor Glenn over here. Don't worry, you can stay seated. But if I were to say, you know what? I'm going to pick up Pastor Glenn right now, okay? <laughs> we may have some success, 
all right? It wouldn't be comfortable for either of us or for anybody watching, all right? But it would also be a little bit of a struggle. And there may be some similarities in the way that I'm trying to get him up and the way that I'm trying to get the baby up. I may be struggling. I may be taking my time. I may be very carefully trying to do this thing. But it's a totally different problem. I'm not trying to be gentle here. I'm trying to exert my strength. I'm trying to use it all. And if I'm not able to carry Pastor Glenn around, it's not because I'm gentle. It's because I'm weak. It's because I can't handle it. But when I hold that baby carefully in my hands, I am trying to restrain my strength. It's kind of like this picture right here, right? When you think of the word gentleness. Being able to be soft enough and careful enough that you don't damage the thing that you're holding. The truth is, there is no such thing as gentleness without strength. If, if, if you don't have strength, you don't need gentleness, right? You only need gentleness when you have to restrain your strength. That's when it's only called for. And that's why I say that gentleness, one of the best definitions I can think of right now, or at least in my own words, I'm sure there are a lot better ones, but when I'm thinking about it, I, I say this, gentleness is really measured strength, Knowing how much strength to use, when to use it, what amount of strength you use. Whether that's talking about with your words, whether that's talking about how you interact with somebody, whether it's talking about your physical attributes, how much strength you use in each situation. Gentleness is the quality of knowing how to measure your strength. This isn't just to men, guys. I'm not talking. This is for everybody. I have met a lot of people, men and women, that have been strong and haven't known how to measure their strength. Haven't known how to control their strength. Haven't known when and how to respond to a situation. And when you don't know how to measure your strength, to hold back, to withhold, to control, you know what happens? You can hurt somebody. You can break something. Yeah. That little bird that we just saw, its life was in the hands of the person that was holding it. Right? That baby that I'm holding in my hands and I'm being careful with, it's not because I'm afraid of the baby. It's not because the baby is so heavy. It's me realizing that this very life is now in my hands. And my movements, my decisions at this point mean life and death for that little one. That's why gentleness is so crucial in how we respond to people, how we treat people, how we react to situations. Gentleness matters. Jesus talked about how important gentleness was. He used the word, he used the word meek, but it's the same version of, of gentleness. It's just the, the, the more the present term. In Matthew chapter 5, when he was talking about the Sermon on the Mount, you know, and, and the Beatitudes, Jesus said a list of things that, you know, have, have really impacted society over the years, and this is one of them. He said this statement, real simple, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are the gentle, for they're the ones that are going to inherit the earth. You say, what? How? <laughs> when? When I look around, that's, that doesn't seem to be the way that it's working. That doesn't seem the way that I've seen it. It seems like the ones that are in control, the ones that are, are, are actually winning in life, the ones that have the most stuff are the strong, the assertive, the dominant, not the gentle. Those that are willing to go and take no prisoners and do as much damage as they want and stand on the back of whoever they need to stand on to get ahead. Not the gentle. But Jesus said it. Blessed are the gentle, for they will inherit the earth. Why is gentleness important? It's important because um, at the end of the day, strength wins wars but gentleness wins hearts. Aggression can win arguments, 
but gentleness will win people. And the message of the gospel, the message of Christianity, it's been tied to gentleness for so long. Not aggression. Sometimes, don't get me wrong, lots of times aggression has been used in the name of Christ. But Jesus taught a message of gentleness and said, this is the way that we are going to win. Because yes, you can go out and assert your truth on others. You can take the, the ground by force. You can try to dominate. You can have, try to have a bigger army. You can try to have more weapons. And you can try to take as much ground as you want. But the only way you're going to win the hearts of the people that you're fighting for is with gentleness. So kindness, love, respect. You say, no, no, it's truth. Truth, yes, 100%. I would never say anything else but truth. But it's not just the truth, it's the way the truth is expressed that matters. Trust me, I'm preaching to myself right here. Because I really, can I say the word suck? I suck at that. All right? Ask, ask people to work with me. All right? I was walking around today with one of, uh, one of the mugs that someone gave me on my staff, and it just said tears on my staff. And, I, and I, I, I laugh about it. You know, it's funny. And I try my best to be gentle with everyone. And I think they all love me. But the truth is, sometimes just when I'm expressing truth, I forget the importance of gentleness. And I'll just say it. Say it like it is. Not realizing until a little bit later, oh, what I just said may have been 100% true, but that doesn't mean that it didn't leave a mark. You see, this is what was expressed way back in Proverbs, Proverbs' book of wisdom. It's all about wisdom. Proverbs 15 and 1. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. This isn't about truth or not right here. It's the way we answer. So you can ask me a question, and I have the ability to answer you with the truth in a way that can make you angry or a way that can turn away your wrath and tell you the exact same thing. And I can see it. Some of the ladies are looking over at their husband. See? <laughs> right? Trust me, I get it. I get it. I've struggled with this. This very week, I've struggled with this. Somebody, somebody told me, it's not what you said, it's how you said it. I'm like, well, no, I didn't say anything wrong. It's not what you said, it's how you said it. But I didn't say anything wrong. It's not what you said, it's how you said it. But I didn't say anything wrong. I think it ended somewhere along there. <laughs> the person is not too angry with me now, but they're at least trying their best to tell me the truth. <laughs> they care enough about me to tell me that how I say it matters along with what I say. That's what gentleness is. Gentleness, measuring your strength. Truth is powerful. Perhaps the most powerful thing we have in this world is truth. Perhaps the most powerful thing that you have access to is the truth. Jesus is the truth. But that doesn't mean you can wield truth however you want without worrying about the consequences of what you're doing with it. For too long, too many have done that in the name of Christianity and said, I've got the truth, so I don't matter what's going to happen. I'm just going to go out and cause as much damage as possible. Power can win wars. But gentleness will win people. Do not sacrifice truth on the altar of gentleness, but incorporate it. Measured strength. How you say it matters. And you say, but I'm just a, I'm just a person who says it what it is, and that's somebody else, because that's how I think, right? It's like, well, if you don't like what I said and it's the truth, that sounds like a you problem, <laughs> not, not a me problem, right? And that's the root of it. That's the root of it. That's, that's where my problem comes from. Because I think that that's a them problem. Because I don't consider that how I say things matter. How you say things do matter. Jesus was gentle. You say, so Jesus never confronted? No, no, no. Remember, I said measured strength. There are times for a higher level of confrontation. Next week we talk about that. Okay? But you need to know who you're dealing with. Because sometimes... The person that you're dealing with is fragile. Sometimes the situation demands a soft touch. 
Sometimes that person who deserves, and, and they've wronged you, and they've hurt you, and they've done terrible things to you, and they deserve to be put in their place, but the reason they did all those things is because they have already been broken. And you can put them in their place and win an argument, but destroy the person further in the process. How do you help with gentleness? See, this is a real issue right now in, in the world, in today's climate. I think social media has made this worse. And you hear me blame social media for a lot of things, and it's because social media is, is at fault for a lot of things. That's the truth. I'm not saying there's no good in it. Folks here today watching on, on Facebook, and it's a great way to spread truth, but you lose something. You lose the context. You, you lose the ability to be gentle, especially with something like Twitter, where when it first came out, you were only allowed to use 140 characters. That's 140 letters to prove your point. So what gets tossed out? Now it's up to 280. That's still not a lot. If you're measuring every one of your, your, your letters... So what gets tossed out sometimes? The gentleness, the context, the friendliness. I'm just saying my truth, getting it out there. Don't care what it happens to it. Don't care who it offends. Don't care how much damage is done. How much of the polarization today in our society is because we've lost the ability to deal with our opponents gently. You say, well, now sometimes we need to be stronger. I agree. Again, tune in next week. We'll get there. But as I said before, it's not just about winning a war. It's about winning people. And too often, when we just go online and have these arguments, it seems that everyone is an enemy, potentially. If you, if you agree with me, we're good. We're on the same page, as long as you agree with everything I say. You disagree? Well, you're against me. Agree with me, you're for me. Disagree with me, you're against me. What if there was another way? What if there's a way that the church could demonstrate? What if there's a way that we could live like Jesus, the way of gentleness, where I can be against you, or sorry, I can be against your argument clearly, but I can be for you. And you leave the argument not even doubting for a second that this person is for me even if they disagree with me. This person cares about me even though they disagree with everything I say. That's almost unheard of for a lot of people growing up in our culture today. We've lost the ability to be able to interact like that. And I think if we are going to redeem the culture around us, if we're going to reclaim, then we need to not just come forward with the, the strength of the truth, but also the gentleness of Jesus, to be able to let people know that I am saying this because I love you, because I care about you, because I care about people, because I care about my neighbor, because I care about the world, not just because I want to be right. Gentleness is used in the New Testament Several times in Galatians chapter 6, Paul says this, Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourself, or you may also be tempted. So, so hear this. Somebody has been caught. Somebody has actually did something wrong. Fill in the blank, whatever you want it to be. They've been caught stealing. They've been caught cheating. They've been caught whatever. And, and you're the one that caught them. And you know that they're in the wrong. They need help. They need to be restored. Not cast off, restored. How do you do it? Gently. Gently. This is from Paul. Paul's words weren't always gentle. But he understood that. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 to 3. As a prisoner for the Lord then... I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you've received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. And here we see the idea again that somehow keeping unity and, and bearing with one another and forgiving each other is tied up in this idea of gentleness and humility. 
These two are related to each other. And it seems like this is a common theme in the New Testament over and over, that the idea of living together in unity, living with people you may have disagreements with, part of the way you're going to successfully do that is by adopting a spirit of gentleness. Good news. It's a fruit of the Spirit. God wants to build it in you. He's trying to build it in you. It's good news. Colossians 3. Someone agree with me, I think, over there. It's awesome. Amen. Colossians 3. Verses 8 to 11. This is talking about the same idea. But, and this is Paul again writing to the Colossians church. And these, these things I'm reading, by the way, for anyone that may not know the context, these are a series of letters that um, one of the first believers, one of the first leaders in the church by the name of Paul, sent out to various churches trying to address local problems. And now we adopt it as, as scripture. We believe that God inspired these words, and we believe that they're not just for them, but they can also be applied to us. But now you must also rid yourself of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you've taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. That's what I told you about a few minutes ago, right? The new self that God wants to make in you and is building in you. Very biblical. You put off his new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of his creator. And this is beautiful. Here, there's no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free. But Christ is all and is in all. He's saying it doesn't matter about your cultural, your racial, your economic differences. Jesus wants to bring unity. He wants to work through all of us. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, that's us. That's the people that have said yes to him. He's chosen us as his own family. Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. That's what you're going to need to be able to build that unity in that diverse group of beliefs, opinions, cultural perspectives. You need those things. That's why it's a fruit of the Spirit. Bear with each other. Bear with each other. That doesn't mean... When, when you hear that word, when you're bearing with somebody, it doesn't mean that necessarily you're always enjoying it. It means you bear with it. Bear with people even when you disagree and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them together in perfect unity. You see, this is, this is 2,000 years ago. Paul was telling us how we are to live in a society where people come with different perspectives, different ideas, different backgrounds, and how you can live together and seek the truth together. You need gentleness as part of that mixture. You need it. First Tim, sorry, 2 Timothy 2, finishing up here. Don't have anything to do with the foolish and stupid arguments. <laughs> Remember, he didn't, he, Paul wasn't always gentle. This is what I love about him. Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments because you know they produce quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. And here it is. Opponents, because you will have opponents, you can disagree, must be gently instructed. See, it's not wrong to have opponents, to people that disagree. The truth is, the truth will always divide. There will always be people on either side. Everything is not true. There's only one set of things that are true. So you have opponents, deal with them gently in the hope that God will grant them repentance. At the end of the day, this is what Jesus taught. This is what he lived. This is how he demonstrated. Sorry, I know we're a little late, but I'm coming to the end. There's one story in Scripture that I really love. I know those of you that are here every week, you hear me say that a lot, but I love a lot of Scripture. But there's one story I really love in Jesus' ministry where he was interacting with a person. It's found in John chapter 8. If you want to bear with me real quickly. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. This is Jesus. Now, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. Now, we need to understand something. We're talking here about the teachers of the law and the Pharisees. These were the religious leaders, the cultural leaders. They were the people that everyone looked up to at the day. Jesus was this new upstart that was going out, and he was saying things that was challenging the established system of the day. And the people that were in power did not like that. They didn't like to be challenged. So they said, we're going to trick them. 
The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. Adultery was something at that point that wasn't just considered morally wrong, but legally wrong. Somebody who had committed adultery and was actually proven to have committed adultery, at that point in that system, you could have killed them by stoning. Not what you think. Not, not stoning as we use the word stoning, but literally throwing rocks at the person until they died. Terrible, I know, but that was the legal system of the day. They made her stand before the group. So you got a big group here, and they bring this woman in, humiliated, terrified, crying. We don't know the situation. We don't know why she was there. We don't know how she was caught. We don't know if she was trapped. We don't know if, if she was a willing participant. We don't know if she's a prostitute. We don't know what it was. We just know that she was caught doing something that at that point was morally, legally wrong. And she's standing in front of all these people, a lot of them men, most of them. And they said to Jesus, teacher, coming to him with that, that attitude, teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They were trying to set him up. They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. In other words, they didn't care about the law. They didn't care about the woman. All they wanted was to use this to try to catch him. Because if he comes out and says, well, just let her go, they're going to say, oh, so you don't believe the law of Moses. He's worse than the other guys. Or they say, oh, let's have her killed. Everybody is going to remember this gentle Jesus now killing a woman in the middle of the street. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. He chose a third way. He didn't even address them. When they kept on questioning him, finally he straightened up and said to them, Hey, let any of you who's without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. One sentence. That's how he addressed it. Whoever's without sin, you guys go first. Now, here's the ironic thing. He was the only one there who was without sin. He didn't grab a rock. At this, those who heard began to go away, one at a time. The older ones first. A little wiser. Maybe a little gentler. Until only Jesus was left, with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? Remember, this is only a second sentence now. No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I. He had the right. Go now and leave your life of sin. He didn't sacrifice the truth. But he brought gentleness into the equation. And here's the thing. Lots of times we look at this and we say, he was gentle to the woman. He wasn't just gentle to the woman. He was gentle to everybody in that group. He could have addressed that a number of ways. He could have put them in their place. He had put Pharisees and teachers of the law in their place. But let me tell you something. Those men that left, each and every one of them, I wonder how many of them left reconsidering the way that they treat people. Reconsidering the way they look at those types of people reconsidering the way they looked at Jesus. I wonder, he, he could have expressed the truth in a way that every single person would have left feeling condemned and feeling ashamed and feeling angry and feeling entrenched in their beliefs, but instead, he did it in such a way that every one of them left with a question and probably an open door. I wonder how many followers he gained that day out of that very group that were ready to stone her. I wonder how many of them saw the wisdom, the gentleness, the kindness, and the truth combined in such a way that they said, this is it. This is the battle we're fighting, folks. This is the battle we're fighting each and every day. Truth matters, but so does gentleness, kindness, respect. I get angry with a lot of things I read online, and I get a sense of satisfaction seeing people put in their place sometimes that I probably shouldn't. And sometimes I can, I can guiltily indulge in watching things online, forgetting that this is real life and it's real people. And sometimes that can leak out into my everyday life. 
I believe that truth needs to be restored. I believe that error needs to be confronted. I believe that our society needs to be fixed. I believe that there's a lot of errors out there that the truth needs to be shone on. But I believe that ultimately, if we're going to fix things, if we're going to win hearts, we do it not just with the truth, but also with gentleness. Teaching in love. Perhaps a lot of you have been noticing uh, just one of these issues that seems to be pop- popping up here in our community right now. I wasn't going to address it right away, but um, how many of you have been following online the drama centered around the hub here in Wetaskiwin? Yeah. How much anger, how much resentment, how much tearing at each other's throats is being created. Trust me, there is a truth here that needs to be addressed. And I'm not going to stand up here and tell you this is not what I'm teaching about today. But I'm saying it's a complicated issue. And the truth is deeper than just pushing one side or the other. But as the church, I think it would be our obligation to bring light and gentleness and love into the equation being able to say, hey, here's the truth, here are the facts, here's what happened, and let me do it with an attitude of Jesus. Unfortunately, I don't know if there's a place to be able to do that online or not. I don't know if it works on Facebook. I don't know if it does. I believe that there's changes that need to be made everywhere, always, in order to bring about the best. But I think in order to actually win people, we need to do it the right way. If you have questions and you want to talk to me about this after, by all means, I'm certainly willing to share my opinions on these types of subjects. Right now, the message is not what you're saying, it's how you're saying it. Let's let gentleness rule in our life. Let's let gentleness flow through us. There is a time for speaking up in a louder voice. Jesus taught us that. Come back next week. But too often, we make enemies of people instead of winning people. Not because we didn't say the truth, but because of the way we said it. Lord, I pray that you would help us. Help us to be a people that live like you lived. Help us to be a people that live like you are. Help us, Lord, to demonstrate gentleness and kindness in our interactions. Lord, I thank you for your truth. I thank you for the strength and the power that is in your words and your truth in your word. Lord, I thank you that you have given us solutions and wisdom and guidance. I thank you, Lord, that you are concerned about the things that matter in this life. But Lord, I pray that as we go out and we interact in this world, that we would not be afraid to speak up at the right times. But I pray that we would always Do it in such a way that brings honor to you and doesn't shut the door down to relationship with others. I pray, Lord, that we would be able to be a people that that reflect your goodness, your kindness, your gentleness. Lord, help us to measure our words. And I pray, Lord, that um, we would never be afraid to speak up when we need to speak up. But I also pray, Lord, that we would be caring about the individual, not just about being right. Give us that wisdom and guidance that only you can give. Help us to care. Help us to be gentle. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 If you're here today and you have questions about faith or what it means to follow Jesus, I'd love for you to come and talk to me after the service. One of our leaders that have been up here today, any of us, we'd love to be able to answer questions, love to be able to pray with you if you have something that needs prayer. Uh, We're here for you. For the rest of you, I'd love to be able to, to see a lot of you today here sticking around for food. If you can't, we understand. Go with God, God's blessing on you. But for those that can stick around, we're going to be bringing some tables out here, I think is what's happening in a few minutes. So just you come mingle around yourself, amongst yourself. Uh, we're going we're gonna to close in prayer. We're going to mingle amongst yourself. And as tables get set up, in a few minutes, we'll invite everybody to come in and grab some food. Thanks for being here today. Thank you for being online. God bless. Go with God. And Lord, we thank you for this time of fellowship together. Bless our food, bless our meal in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen. God bless. Thank you all for being here. Amen. We could get a little music. Thank you. few individuals that could help uh, bring in some tables. We're going to put tables along the back here and in the second row along here as well. Amen.